So I'm leaving today. And uh, first of all, my gratitude to everyone for your kindness and your inspiration. I uh, have a, a community which seems to be very engaged. You're very beautifully engaged with each other. You're engaged with the larger community, which is, to me, something we haven't yet managed to do in Tisar. And our communities, like I was saying, our community is more an island in a sea of not quite rednecks, but it's, it's kind of, sometimes they're good people, but not so interested in us. They sort of see your, your connection with each other and then the connection with the larger community. It's, it's terribly, very inspiring, very inspiring. And then the way you're able to manage this very complex site with its water, electricity, um, very difficult terrain. My monasteries are very flat. Where you have roads and then you have walking paths on top of each other, so it's a it's a vertical monastery rather than a horizontal monastery, which is, which is takes some doing. Um, so thank you, yeah, thank you everyone for being so kind and welcoming. Um, as we were talking about Halloween, I was in I was in Ottawa. One Halloween, and I was walking along in a park, along a park, and there was some chap in front of me, dressed in as a pumpkin or something like that, <laughs> as one does in Halloween. <laughs> and, uh, I was looking at him; he looks odd. <laughs> and then I thought, "Uh oh, they all think I'm a Halloween," because. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a Halloween outfit. <laughs> anyway, um, some more serious dhamma. Uh, some of you might have heard me talking that uh, when I was in Temple Monastery for their katina, some of the IMS teachers came to visit and pay respects to Long Paul. It was Joseph Goldstein, Carol Wilson, uh, Guy, and Sally Armstrong, Kurt. Greg, 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 and five of the younger teachers, and Ron Paul was very, very moved that they would come and, and pay respects to him, and then he really got into a flow of dharma, and in, and in that, Ajahn Jayanta asked me, um, since I've known Ron Paul for so many years, uh, how have I seen his teaching change, and I answered fairly immediately that Ron Paul has always emphasized the unconditioned right from the get-go, from what I can remember. Um, so that phrase, the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unborn, has been something that one of the major offerings that he turned me towards, and that was my, my interest, the transcendent. Um, and then he went on a, on a lovely, lovely talk about, about awareness. And my own, my own practice, I, I like to use, I, I like to use language that is enigmatic and that presents to me the background. If it's hard to put in words, isn't it? And so I use that analogy of background and foreground. Um, and, and the background to me is what is most uh, fulfilling in, in the terms of, of the heart, of that deep possibility of silence of the transcendent. But the foreground is also can be very fulfilling because that's where I learn about my foibles, my limitations, but also that's where I have a chance to try to be creative and offer myself to community and things like that. And getting, getting those both are, to me, terribly important. If it was just the, the background, I could, as maybe I've tried in the past, just become just be interested in quietism, where I don't want to be bothered about complexity. And yet, also I've seen in myself just the obsessive nature of complexity, the compulsions of, of the foreground, where I'm just always overly engaged. When I was, when Lone Paul, being with Lone Paul in um, at Tisserana, 
he, yes, he's always offering me little phrases which I which I write down and try to ponder deeply. And his uh, latest phrase, which I've been sharing with some of you, uh, that he had written by his lamp. He didn't tell me what the source was. Maybe he he sourced it himself. But he said, he put it this way: "This open unknowingness is what I am, not an object that I know." And and we were talking a lot about how in Theravada you don't use the "I am" statement. Uh, Advaita Vedanta uses the "I, I am" statement. And yet I find that, that quite, quite powerful, that, because it's not an I am statement of, of, of ego identity, but it is like stating quite powerfully that this awareness, this open unknowingness, is the goal, is the result. Don't have to go looking for an object. And so I've been using that for the last three months. Now, that might be enigmatic or, or not make sense, but phrases like that which bring you to the silence of the mind, I find very, very interesting, very profitable. So then, a few years ago, I was, I was using, is presence ever absent? And these are not, they're not phrases that can be answered uh, in the foreground of the intellect, because that's really one of the problems, is that the freedom of the mind cannot be a conclusion or an opinion. It's not like 2 plus 2 equals 4, that you come to a conclusion. This, this open unknowingness to me seems to be, it's dynamic, it's vibrant, it's not fixed, and yet you can't really locate it as an object. So I would, you know, as a kind of recommendation from an older monk, I would say, be very, very diligent in your, in, in your morning practice. Put a lot of attention in the morning practice. Because the morning practice is the time where the world hasn't manifested so strongly in your consciousness, all your duties and responsibilities. And so the foreground is somewhat muted when you wake up. And if you, if you attend to a, a strong morning practice, and I, and I do mean... A serious number of hours in in the morning, then that should be touching the the background, the kind of fulfillment of the silence of the mind and the openness of the heart, and that brings tremendous uh, confidence. That brings a lot of confidence, and it's not the confidence of an opinion. It's not the confidence of the intellect. It's the confidence of the heart. And if you have that, then if you have a strong morning practice then as you enter into the world, first of all, I think, you, I think you've honored your samana vocation. If it's just about the foreground, and life gets busy in the foreground in the various ways we can, then I don't think, I, I wouldn't be honoring my vocation as a samana because the transcendence is so important to me. And this isn't a dismissal of the foreground, but it actually enhances my capacity to function and the various responsibilities I have. So that that fulfillment of, of the silence of the mind, the openness of the heart, gives you the kind of confidence. But also I think in all of us are kind of working on some kind of a theme, some problematic part of our mind or some aspect of Dharma that we're considering. And that also comes up in morning practice, I think. So then the theme that you're working on, and I'm always working on some theme, so right now I'm using that language of unknowingness, that theme gets, what should, should we say, gets um, invigorated in the morning practice and gets the intention of that theme gets heightened in the morning practice. And then you find that carrying through in the foreground of mundane activities, which are important, which are very, very important. Um, so, you know, there was the famous story, I think it was with Ajahn Ajiro, when he went, and he was Philip, Anagarka Philip in uh, Chithurst, and he went to, I think it was him, he went to Wapapom as we were starting Chithurst, and uh, Rumpa Cha said to him, Samaria will teach you about enlightenment, but I'll teach you how to wash your bowl. Which is a lovely line. 
And so to have that culmination, to have this beautiful training, so the way the the katina, the katina was conducted yesterday, all the beautiful samaki in the sewing, uh, and then the, the formal offering that we could all participate in. This is this is very significant. It's very very significant because it gives us a uh, a way of of kalyanamita samaki and all and and that where we can be expressive where we can express gratitude and service and the softening of the heart through that and that kind of opening that we can do with each other. And yet, also to not forget there is the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unborn. If there were not the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unborn, there would be no way out of birth and death. And so summon a life to me seems as good as you could get. It's just, it seems to be the foreground is, is, is beautifully tended to and is a, the place of our expression is of, of human beings. And it gives us meaning. And, and the meaning of my life is not just me as an individual functioning, but it's the, the meaningfulness of community, also the meaningfulness of place. You, know, you have your, your beautiful trees here and the different topography and the heat, uh, and all of that, and we have our winters and our mosquitoes, and living in a place for periods of time becomes, to me, very, very meaningful. I know, you know, I know, I know the local squirrels, and the local chipmunks, and the red-tailed hawk, and the turkeys that come by, and so one has a sense of not just being some kind of Sputnik in the world, but I am I'm embedded in the world, in the world of things, because I participate in the world of things. And I think that groundedness in, in the reality of things, and the doing of things, and the contribution to the way of things, then gives you the human balance to also contemplate the transcendent. And so I think, say, Abhay Giri is a beautiful, beautiful example of that, and so I think we're all very, very grateful to the uh, Ajans and uh, lay people who have held this and made this place grow and allow us all to be here and all those who sustain it now. This is very, uh, it's quite wonderful to see what you're doing here. So I'll leave that for reflection then.